Welcome back to episode uh, three, the growth dilemma part three. What if the problems with escape and lies was in the past? Too good to be true, but uh, maybe Magnus here has the solution. But first, Magnus, you have to tell me, how did you end up in the aquaculture industry? Well, so uh, I'm uh, actually a marketer. So my uh, position in uh, Fisk uh, is a marketing manager. And uh, I was kind of just searching for a job in uh, Trondheim. Uh, and I was intrigued by the uh, aquaculture industry. And uh, so I, um, I got the job. Uh, what are you supplying to the aquaculture industry? So Fisk is a supplier of uh, large scale closed cage systems for uh, uh, fish farmers. And um, they are for production of uh, post molt. Yeah. Yeah. So in our uh, run since 2014, we have delivered about, I think, 24 cages, uh, all of them closed. And in this one, we have, uh, or in uh, those, we have produced uh, 30 million post molt uh, across 80 production cycles, uh, none of which have had any lice or uh, escapes or anything. And, and what is the advantage of this? Uh closed cage that you are delivering uh, the way it works you you uh, get the post uh, sorry the, the the smolt into the cage at about maybe 100 grams and then take them up to maybe a, around a kilo and uh, in our cages you can have one million of them so you practically create a much more resilient fish so later when you transfer the post smolt into the open nets uh, you have a fish that has never had any delization uh, and it's much more kind of uh, ready for the open environment. For a fish, it's a, it's a big thing to go from fresh water, small, right. small, yeah, you and can, be thrown into a, the big world of the ocean. You can kind of uh, look at it as some kind of uh, kindergarten, right? Yeah. So. You have a flagship, it's called Protectus. Yeah. And, and what are the features there since you call it a flagship? So Protectus is our uh, largest uh, scale model. Uh, it is. Uh, it holds about 30,000 cubic meters of water, so it's uh, quite large. If you look at it from one side to the other, it's about 50 meters. Wow! Yeah, um, and it has uh, like a, a PVC material uh, and a net, so it's like a double uh, barrier. So it's both, like the, the, the fish is protected both from the outside, like lice, uh, and also from escaping. Yeah, so uh, we have a uh, a couple of those in production uh, as we speak. I am sure it's going to be a successful Aquanoir for you, and I'm also sure it's not going to be your last Definitely Aquanoir, not. Magnus. We are now very keen to see how the students have been working. It's time for the Next Generation Student Award. Shortly now, we're going to find out who is the winner of this year's student camp. Mia, Elena, Costa, you are in the jury. Yeah, that's correct. You have actually been a participant before. Yeah, I have. It was stressful, but it was also very giving. It means a lot to both the industry and the student as well, because it creates a bridge between education and the industry. This year, how would you rate the, or evaluate what they have done? We find a lot of inspiring students with a very innovative uh, ways to look at the uh, different cases. It's very impressive how much they have done on so short time. How difficult was it? To decide a winner, yeah, we uh, we had uh, a long dis discussion and uh, it was very tight, but uh, we found a winner uh, with the small margins. And the winner is Group Three. This is the group that uh, took away the award as the best group for the student camp working with technology as a mean to create local value. And 
What kind of solution did you end with? AquaLearn is our solution. It's a digital platform which helps the student to learn about aquaculture in the remote areas without moving out of the town. And we thought of expanding it into a level which the people from outside can come and work in the remote areas, in the uh, coastal communities using AquaLearn uh, by connecting it with the NAV and uh, the other organizations as well. Very smart. But, but how was it to work with such a short time? It was really stressful, but I also think that it made it work because then we had to come up with a solution like really quick. And you know, as a student, that actually having a tight deadline, yeah, it makes you perform. Talk. Yeah, it always works. <laughs> Ship or talk? It's a Norwegian word for uh, doing things uh, very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very inter international group. And in terms of skills and background, somehow complementing each other. Okay, you won 10,000 kronas. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to form a company now with its start capital? Maybe we can work on with uh, our idea. <laughs> it, w it would be cool. And in a couple of years' time, I will see you working in some of the aquaculture companies. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Congratulations Thank to you. Thank you very much. And the student camp was once again very successful. During Aquanur 2025, there are prestigious awards. And I'm sure that uh, Anders Fjellheim here is very happy to have received the Fish Welfare Award. Yes, I'm very happy to uh, achieve uh, this prize. It's a big achievement for Salmar. So we are very happy to get this. Why did you get this award? We got this uh, award because we have uh, phased out the use of uh, cleaner fish in all our production. So instead of cleaner fish, you are using other methods to battle the lice? Yeah, definitely. We have uh, closed uh, systems, lice skirts. We have lasers, farms where we lower to 20, 30 meters of depth. So we have different kind of technologies that we use. You are a PhD in fish farming. Yeah, that's and, correct. And have you sort of concluded on which method is uh, more efficient than the other? I think we have to have uh, several technologies to solve this problem. It's yeah. not one solution to all the cases that we have. We have different sites, uh, different conditions, so we have to have different kinds of technologies. Yeah, but this award will probably make you and your team work even harder on fish welfare. Yeah, we will. Uh, and it's a very positive thing to get such a prize because we are battling reputation uh, now. So uh, I think uh, this fish welfare prize is very good for us to get. Yeah, there's also uh, a lot of focus on mortality. Yeah. And uh, what is uh, your strategy and what, what kind of goals have you set? We are working on different strategies to improve the uh, mortality. Uh, and our goal is to have 97% survival of salmon in our productions. And that's by 2030? Yeah, we have about 94% uh, survival today. So we are getting there. There is a, a lot of focus on the fish farmers and it's also good to have some positive feedback on your work. Definitely. Good luck uh, with your farming on this and yes. congratulations on the prize. Thank you. And we will have more about fish welfare shortly. Lots of young competent people in the aquaculture business and I have one here, Cecilia Rockne. You are a sustainability manager in STEAM. But first I'd like to know a little bit more about how you ended up in the aquaculture business. I actually grew up in a family running restaurants. So uh, with, uh, with sort of from our whole upbringing food production and how food is made has been a big interest of mine and uh, curiosity. And you recently delivered your master thesis. Yes. Uh, and what was the subject? Uh, the subject was how to utilize byproducts from aquaculture in sub-Saharan Africa. Wow! Yes. And uh, that's quite a way from uh, where you are now in, in STEAM. What is exactly STEAM? Well, STEAM offers fish health products and advice. So in a way you could call us a health house where we have both veterinarians, fish health biologists and various environmental biologists uh, that assist in advising farmers on how to produce healthy fish and then we also offer, we, uh, we have our own products but we also distribute various pharmaceuticals and vaccines. A one-stop shop for fish welfare? 
you could call it that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, a healthy fish is uh, probably a more tasty fish, but it's also a more economical uh, fish. So we need to keep the, this on the agenda. And, and how do you feel this has been taken seriously around the world? I think it's been taken seriously from the industry <laughs> because as it's a costly issue, of course, um, and it's also a moral responsibility where um, not only is it costly for the farmer in terms of loss, uh, it's also costly for the farmer in terms of every mortality is essentially a wasted food. Um, and then you also have the potential to reduce the resource input to production, which of course saves the planet, but also money. Healthy fish is also uh, a matter of reputation for uh, the industry. Yes, definitely. Mm. So uh, it's uh, not only would it I think it would taste better for the consumer, not necessarily in, uh, in actual flavor, but the feeling of when you eat it, because you know it's an animal where, um, uh, where it's not suffered from a lot of mortality. And, and of course, the, the numbers of mortality is a lot in, in focus, and Absolutely. we can always improve, but uh, we can't get it to zero. Uh, I think it will be difficult, and I don't know if there is any animal production with zero mortality. I don't think there is, but uh, not in my time, maybe in your time. Maybe, hopefully. Cecilia. <laughs>and a big seven kilo fish. Ah. <laughs> so are you able to produce these sizes? Yes, I mean the fish that we harvested uh, the start of this year had the uh, average size of uh, seven kilo live weight, yes. And, and that's really a size that's very popular in, in Asia and yes. in China. They like the big fish over there, yes. Why did you want to go to China? Yeah, I was also firstly contacted by Ove Nordland and I was thinking China, no, no, it's too complicated, it's too far away. But then uh, I looked more into it and I thought, yeah, it's interesting because uh, of course today we are flying a lot of fish via air into China and the market has so good potential to grow. And uh, we can just see this year 50,000 tons extra into, uh, into the country and we can only produce four of those. So it's th there are huge potentials for growing maybe up to several hundred thousands more. So it's not going to wipe out Norwegian salmon from oh, China market. We can only take a tiny bit of the of the growth. <laughs> so no. <laughs> and and how is the, the the salmon you produce received in the in the market? It's actually been perceived very well. I mean, it's very fresh because it's so new, uh, and uh, they say they're not used to so so fresh fish. They think it's a little bit uh, firm, too firm maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's interesting. It's good quality and good reception, and uh, yeah. And and and. Where is the market? What kind of consumers and, and clients appreciate this lamb-based, locally produced salmon? Yeah, we have been selling uh, much through the same channels that Norwegian fish is entering into. And most of the consumption is in uh, sushi restaurants in China. Uh, there are somewhere between uh, 70 and 80,000 of these uh, sushi restaurants, so there's a lot of fish needed to supply them. Yeah, and given your experience in the field, uh, you have uh, of course, a high chance to, to do this successfully. And you have a lot of Norwegians with you in, in this operation. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the competence is, is coming from here. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, we cannot rely on Chinese that have never sound farmer before. Uh, so we, we, we have brought in some experts and we, uh, they have been responsible for, uh, for learning up a, a group of young Chinese. Uh, and, and do you think this will sort of spread around the, in China when, when you are successfully getting salmon into the market? Yes, I think there will be room for many producers. Uh, if the growth in the market is going to be as we expect, maybe to, to several hundred tons, maybe three, four, five hundred thousand tons, then we need a lot of production and it will take 20 years to build up that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, It will yes. be an interesting market for everyone for a long, long time. Yes, it will, yes. 
So and, and, and of course, most people live in China. <laughs> yeah. But you being from the Faroe Island, uh, uh, have you had a chance while, while in China to follow the, the Faroe uh, aquaculture industry? Yes, of course. I'm always uh, following it a little bit. I've been involved in Faroese uh, aquaculture for a long while myself. Yeah. So I still follow it, yes. Where, where do you see the difference between uh, how we do things in Norway and how we do things in the Faroe Islands? It is very similar. Yeah. It is not so different, uh, but there are only three players in, in yeah. Faroe Islands. So it's easy to find ways of collaborating. Uh, and also we are very close to the government. Yeah, in Faroe Islands you can fit the whole industry around the dinner table yes, and, yes, and, yes. <laughs> and discuss what are we going to do. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us this report from China and a little bit from the Faroe Island. If you follow this episode further, you will also meet the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Fisheries from the Faroe Islands.